Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. I am very pleased to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedicine, where each Friday we enjoy presentations from leading thinkers about the promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held here in historic Charlottesville, Virginia uh, in June. I am delighted to welcome our speaker today, Dr. LaTanya Trotter from the University of Washington in Seattle. Professor Trotter is an associate professor at the, the, in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at University of Washington. She is a sociologist of medicine who studies the existence and reproduction of inequality in the medical workplace. In her work, she takes an institutional view of ethics by considering how social workplace and workplace institutions shape the notions of responsibility and our understanding of what constitutes good or ethical decisions by individual, professional, or organizational actors. She explores these and other questions in her first book entitled More Than Medicine, Nurse Practitioners and the Problems They Solve for Patients, Healthcare Organizations, and the state. In continuing our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science um, Seminar Series theme, Latanya's lecture today is entitled Promise or Peril, the Algorithmic Intelligence and Racial Discrimination in Healthcare. Provider bias is a known driver of racial disparities in healthcare delivery and through minimizing provider discretion, uh, applications of algorithmic intelligence have, been, have the potential to reduce this kind of bias, but they also have the power to further institutionalize discriminatory logics throughout the same mechanism. In her lecture today, Latanya will be describing how this transmutation of medical authority alters the institutional and interactional context of the healthcare encounter in a manner that raises new versions of old concerns at the intersection of bioethics and the reproduction of racial inequality. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Latanya via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, LaTanya. We are so excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Ah, well, thank you so much uh, for that warm and generous introduction. You know, you know, speaking for myself, I was really pleased to be invited to give this talk <clears throat> and to have the chance to speak directly to early career scholars who have so much promise um, to do good work and to make positive change. I don't, however, come to you as an expert on robots or artificial intelligence, uh, but I do have one or two things to say about algorithms. Because although algorithmic thinking has gotten faster, more efficient, and more intelligent, so to speak, the use of algorithms in the medical workplace is a fairly old technology. Still, I do think I owe you a bit of an explanation about when and where I enter this conversation so that you can better understand what's to come. So I'm a sociologist who thinks about the reproduction of inequality and injustice. And so I come to the field of bioethics um, as less a philosopher than a social scientist. Um, and as a social scientist, I focus quite deeply on everyday workplace interactions. I see places like clinics and hospitals as not just places where patients go to have their conditions treated, but as places where people go to work. So I'm less interested in abstract questions of what one ought to do and more interested in ascertaining how workers understand what one might do, which is to say I'm interested in understanding how choice sets get created in the medical workplace. Because day and night, workers in healthcare are making decisions. And some of these decisions are mundane or routine, and some of them are life or death but all of them shape patient outcomes and experience. And I'm particularly interested in understanding why it seems to be the case 
that reproducing inequality is so often the default choice for those decisions. Because make no mistake, that does seem to be the case. Because health disparities are a real and robust finding. In the US context, black people have worse health outcomes than the white populations. So you might wanna know with a little bit more specificity about which outcomes exactly I'm talking about. And I can safely say pretty much all of them. When I first started studying health disparities, this was one of the most startling facts that I learned. Because whether you're talking about chronic diseases like diabetes or looking at a range of different forms of cancer, on almost every measure, African Americans have a higher prevalence and a poorer prognosis. And when you see the same trend for so many outcomes, it starts to seem unlikely that they're a the product of different mechanisms. So scholars began searching for a common mechanisms. Right? And so in doing so, they turned their gaze away from the bodies of individuals and their habits and upstream to the level of structure. So scholars began looking at factors that affect whole communities and populations, such as residential segregation, environmental racism, and differential access to quality K through 12 education. Now, most of these structural causes are produced outside the purview of medicine and the medical workplace, except that is for racism itself. You have scholars like David Williams, Bruce Link, and Joe Phelan, who have argued that racism is the common fundamental cause of both downstream and upstream factors. And the place where racism is most visible and impactful in healthcare is at the level of the medical encounter. So we know, for example, that provider bias is a real and observable practice such that a patient's race is an independent predictor of low quality care. So when a 2005 report published and produced by the Institutes of Medicine, they found, for example, that race, the race of the patient predicted a lower likelihood of receiving appropriate cardiac care, receiving kidney dialysis or transplants, or receiving the best treatments for stroke, cancer, or AIDS treatment. And even when you hold constant variables like insurance status, income, age, and severity of condition, these, these relationships remain robust. Now, the most commonly cited explanation for these differences in care is implicit bias. So implicit bias is something that all human beings do. Right? Our lightning fast cognition relies on stereotyped rules of thumb for its speed. But the shape of many of these rules are not hardwired, but are culturally and socially produced. Sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva has written about white Americans' penchant of segregating themselves from others in social life and housing, education, informal socializing, and family formation. I might add that this segregation is achieved not through peaceful preference, but generally through illegal or violent forms of exclusion. So for Bania Silva, this segregating behavior has created what he calls a white habitus, such that racialized thinking and its associated biases go unchallenged through intraracial socializing or meaningful relationships. So since white healthcare workers are no less likely to have been socialized in a white habitus, they come to work with many of the same implicit biases as the general population. I also don't want to leave out explicit bias because although implicit bias is easier to talk about and so it often receives the most focus in the literature and in the popular um, works, um, but explicit racial bias by healthcare providers is also a real and observable practice. So quantitatively, a 22 survey whose results were published in JAMA found that 21% of patients report having experienced an overt act of racial discrimination. The qualitative data is even more evocative. In her 2019 book, Invisible Visits, scholar Tina Sachs talks about the ways that black middle-class women navigate the healthcare system. And this book is notable because again, um, she's focused on black middle-class women. So class or access to healthcare is not the, the predominant factor. And yet her respondents described in gruesome graphic detail, a lifetime of healthcare encounters that ranged from the uncomfortable to the traumatic. But I think it's important to point out 
that racial ideology and thought and practice is not, as some may think, just the residual leftover um, from science, i.e. it's just standing in for the leftover unscientific beliefs, Yet this racial ideology is often implicated within the education and, and training of healthcare workers. So sociologist Anne Morning did a 2012 study examining the way that scientists write about and teach racial difference. And she found that the idea that race is a biologically real and relevant category is alive and well in science. And so when providers in training are poised to believe through that training, that race is biologically real, then it becomes easier for theories of racial difference to take hold. And take hold it has. And it's rather famous now, 2016 study by Hoffman and colleagues, they found that a surprising number of medical students and residents endorsed what they called false racial beliefs, such as that black people have thicker skin than white folks, that they age more slowly than whites, and that they're more impervious to pain. Moreover, the study found that a belief in these false beliefs um, was correlated with medical errors in pain assessment. And since pain assessment is a diagnostic criteria for many conditions and illnesses, the potential impact of these beliefs is probably much broader than the pain assessment itself. And these findings refer specifically to medical students and residents, but since medical knowledge is to some extent a shared resource, it's likely that nurses, respiratory therapists, occupational therapists also believe in at least some of this racialized knowledge. And this is where the promise of algorithmic intelligence comes in. Because to the extent that racism is a part of the medical encounter and is reproduced within it, it has the potential, AI has the potential to disrupt its reproduction, primarily by reshaping the behavior of the provider within the interaction. So explicit bias in diagnosis and treatment will be much more difficult to perform when there is an algorithm alerting them that they're not following the evidence in terms of care. <clears throat> And when that algorithm is not just in a published guideline, but is rather embedded in an automated tool that they will have to affirmatively account for if they um, decide to deviate from that decision, which is another way of saying the burden of proof will be higher when one decides against the standard of care produced by the algorithm. It also has the potential to reshape implicit bias. So we know from the psych literature that when you make people aware of their hidden or implicit biases, they're also better able to, through conscious action, think their way towards less bias. So the AI then becomes a part of a set of cognitive, new cognitive resources that the provider uses. Um, so not just through constraint, but through making them more conscious of their incorrect bias decision, um, the AI then will have the potential to alter um, um, implicit bias. And finally, there's the potential to disrupt the transfer of racialized knowledge um, through inf informal cultural transmission that happens both at home, um, through primary socialization and through medical education. So as medical students and residents learn to rely on algorithms as a part of their cognitive toolkit, the influence of racialized views from their upbringing or as dispensed from professors or attendings will wane. But in order for this promise to come to pass, we do have to pay careful attention to the perils. Because it is, I would argue, an unfortunate truth that the same mechanisms that have the potential to reduce provider bias may simply shift the decisions to other institutional locations where the source of the bias will be more hidden and thus less unaccountable to critique and change. So while AI promises to intervene on provider bias, it does so by decreasing autonomy. So when you decrease the scope and number of decisions that workers make, um, the sort of power embedded in those decisions doesn't disappear, it simply moves. So one of the things that I hope to illustrate today is that the places where it moves to are sometimes difficult to trace, to hold to account, and the decisions, therefore, more difficult to intervene on and to change. And also, um, although there's nothing particularly laudable about provider bias, right, um, the one thing it has going for it is that it's not particularly efficient. And what I mean by that is that individual workers are biased in slightly different ways. 
which means that the impact then is variable. So if we think to that 2016 study that looked at um, um, racial, the possession of racial beliefs in med students and residents, not all students held those beliefs, right? And holding those beliefs did not change the decision making of everyone who held them. However, when aspects of the decision are moved from this landscape of individual variability, you may get less bias, but you may also get more efficient bias, bias with no variability, such that racial beliefs become, in effect, racial facts produced and reproduced with 100% efficiency by the algorithm. And finally, in my talk, I want us to think about and think through the conditions of the worker. Because one of the things that workers do is participate um, in everyday acts of resistance to employer control, right? So when we think about um, algorithmic logics, they're not just shaping some kind of abstract encounter, but shaping the behavior of employees through surveillance and constraint. So when you have a society that is structured so unrepentantly around inequality, right, this sort of, um, spaces of resistance are often the moments where workers make a way out of no way. Um, and in healthcare, they do this not just for, their, for themselves, but for their patients. So I want us to consider the healthcare worker as not just a source of technical work or a dispenser um, of acts or activities that can be made more efficient and less biased, but as a worker who improvises and through doing so creates the ground for thinking about and organizing a new reality. So in the remainder of my talk, I want to flesh out some of these particular perils through looking at a series of illustrative cases. So, you know, even though we're all poised to think about AI as being something that exists in the future, I often find it helpful to begin in the past, um, because often the things that we think are new are actually quite old. So I wanna start with a case that probably many of you are familiar with, um, and that's the case of the spirometer. And I wanna start with this case, you know, not because it's really an example of algorithmic thinking, but it's a, or decision-making, but because it's an example of the efficient reproduction of the kind of racial facts that often come to underlie such applications. So I'm taking this sort of historical analysis and understanding of the spirometer from the work of historian Lundy, Lundy Braun, um, her book, Breathing Race into the Machine. So the spirometer. The spirometer is a fairly simple mechanical instrument um, used in pulmonary medicine. It measures lung function. It generates a value that providers use to diagnose respiratory diseases. But this tool, the one that we use today, is an updated version of one that was developed during the 1850s, during the era of slavery. It was originally developed, this barometer in Britain, to measure the lung function of industrial workers, white industrial workers. But when it moved, when this technology moved across the ocean and arrived in the US, um, it was taken up um, by Dr. Samuel Cartwright. Um, um, he was a physician um, that practiced in the antebellum South, and he had a key hand in taking this technology and developing it for use here. So some of that development was technical, but really, mostly it was rhetorical. Because Dr. Cartwright was a proponent of racial science. He believed that the racists were different and that black people in particular were biologically inferior to whites. So for example, he is very well known for arguing before, during, and after the Civil War that one measure of black inferiority is that we supposedly had weaker lung functioning. Um, and he used this as an explanation of why enforced labor, um, either um, through forcing the work of the enslaved or through the forced agricultural labor that came after emancipation, um, he used this to argue that this sort of forced hard manual labor was not detrimental um, to the health of Black Americans, but was actually good and beneficial for us, um, therefore legitimating our place um, in the labor market in these places. So one of the things that I think is really important to remember in talking about this piece of technology is that the spirometer was not a clinical tool. Cartwright did not use it to diagnose or treat patients, black nor white. He used it to literally produce race. 
um, a believer in racial science. He went looking for racial differences. And when you go looking for something, you often find it. Um, so one might even say that in addition to measuring lung function, that one of the core functions of the spirometer is that it was used to produce racial difference, which for Cartwright was synonymous with producing a racial hierarchy. Um, so um, in her explication of the case, um, Lundy Brown's work um, um, notes that there was disagreement um, around this sort of use of the spirometer um, and disagreement around the sort of basic fact um, or argument um, about um, um, Black Americans having lower lung function, right? And I think this is really important when you're talking about a historical case, because people often project back in history that everybody thought the same way in a kind of backwards ideology. But even at the time, there was contention and disagreement. You had other white physicians who had had the occasion um, to evaluate the fitness of Black soldiers during the Civil War. Um, and instead of using Cartwright's spirometer, they used chest measurements um, to evaluate um, fitness, um, and they found no difference. Um, you also had Black scholars such as the statistician Kelly Miller and the sociologist W.B. Du Bois, uh, both of whom denounced both the ideology of the science as well as the statistical methods through which Cartwright apparently proved this racial difference. But um, despite this sort of conflict and disagreement, disagreement it was ultimately Cartwright's perspective, view, and racial ideas that won the day. And not just his day but ours as well. Because of course, between the 1850s and now, the physical apparatus of the, of the spirometer has certainly changed and new more accurate data has been collected since that time. But the racial fact that black people have lower lung capacity than whites lived on unchanged well after Cartwright was dead and buried. Such that today, 150 years after Cartwright's original flawed work, Every time a person performs this test or interprets the results, they become implicated in reproducing this racial fact. And more generally, generally, they become complicit in reproducing the idea that Black people's bodies are categorically different than other kinds of bodies. So it's no wonder that medical students hold fast to their racial beliefs, because while some of their racial beliefs are labeled to be false, Others appear to be standard medical practice. So I wanted to go over this fairly well-known case in part because it's more than an example of race norming, um, but because I think that it illustrates three things. First, I think it shows us how easily and seamlessly the past can live through the present, in part by obscuring the existence of the past. So in this particular case, um, I know I highly doubt that there are very many nurses, pulmonologists, or respiratory therapists who perform this test who have any idea about Cartwright, um, who share his ideas about slavery, or share his racist ideas. And yet every time they participate in this act of race norming, they become the unwitting mechanism for cementing his legacy, which means that the encounter which is supposed to be a medical encounter, remains vulnerable to other interests. Because Cartwright was not just a physician with some mistaken ideas, he was an active proponent of scientific racism and spread his ideology um, through a rigorous public defense um, of slavery. He was someone who made it his life's work to perpetuate racist ideology, and he used his barometer to reproduce that racist ideology through reproducing race. So when we look at the contemporary exam room, although it may seem that the only people in that room are the provider and the patient, we have to consider the ways in which Cartwright too is in that room. He's there through the tool he helped to create and popularize. Um, um, in, in his presence, he has also become a decision maker, a remote and unavailable dead decision maker, but a decision maker nonetheless. Right? So, the physical provider in that room may be racially biased or not, but the decision has been taken out of their hands. It's the machine, um, not the provider who decides whether to reproduce this racial fact. You also have the reality that the power to resist um, has largely been taken from the patient. 
Because while a, a patient can disagree, argue, or challenge sort of visible racism of a provider, um, they cannot do the same with Cartwright's racial ideology. He's a decision maker who's invisible and unaccountable, but who acts with near 100% efficiency, such that the meaning, nature, and even the actors in the encounter have been changed in ways that matter for medical care, medical knowledge, and medical decisions. I also wanted to look more closely at a second case that's less historical and more recent. Um, and that's the case that looks at the measure of kidney function, um, which is the estimate of globular filtration rate um, or the estimated um, um, filtration rate. So GFR is, an, is a measure of how fast a person's kidneys filter blood. Um, so lower kidney filtration rates suggest worse kidney health um, um, and worse kidney function. So since 1999, race was a variable that was used in this calculation. And what happened in 1999 was that there was a single study published which found that black people in the study had higher kidney filtration rates on average than, than whites at the same blood creatinine concentrations. And it's this sort of measure of creatinine concentration um, that is sort of the one that's race normed, if you will, in the EGFR. You also had a second study in 2009 that found similar findings. However, critics of um, this sort of race norming um, of GFR have noted that race is not an explanation. It's merely a proxy for something that's not very well understood. As scholar Rua Benjamin asserts, race is itself an algorithm, um, which is thought to stand in for all kinds of unobserved factors. Um, um, for example, some have, some have hypothesized that the sort of racial difference um, in creatinine clearance um, can be attributed to muscle mass, but others have asked, well, if that's the case, why not just measure muscle mass? Um, but neither in, in, the, in the 1999 study or in the 2009 study, neither of these measure um, this um, explanation nor any other explanatory um, framework. So race um, is um, an algorithm being used, but it's a really poor algorithm, um, one that seems to distract us um, from looking for other kinds of explanations. And the intensity of that distraction has been quite fierce. In the two de decades since the first study, there have been scientific articles, opinion pieces, task forces convened, and on the ground organizing to change the use of race in this calculation. But a whole host of scientists and physicians were publicly resistant to making this change. And the failure, failure to make this change matters. Because unlike in the case of the spirometer, um, the measure of GFR um, um, and, the, and the race norming of it could literally mean life or death for black people. Because this, is, this measure is the primary one um, through which eligibility for dialysis and kidney transplant are determined which if you know the epidemiology of kidney disease, the implications of this are horrifying. 35% of all chronic kidney sufferers in the US are black, even though we're only about 13% of the population. So race norm GFR systematically underestimates the prevalence and severity of kidney disease, which is to say that even though we suffer more, we're less likely to meet the criteria for a kidney transplant or dialysis or other interventions because the racial fact produced was that Black people had to have a higher number to register as having the same amount of illness. Um, so when it came to determining resources, Black people had to meet a higher bar. A study um, by Malika Mindu and colleagues um, um, estimated that um, if the race correction were removed, um, um, an estimated one out of every three black patients would be reclassified as having a more severe stage of chronic, chronic kidney disease. And up to one quarter of black patients would have been reclassified from stage three to stage four of the disease, which is the final stage of kidney failure um, to trigger more advanced care. And this is just one of many studies, far more than the two that set the standard. If there remained resistance to changing it, and in fact, you know, individual hospitals began changing their organizational standards first, mostly because of political organizing and pressure by med students and residents. A uniform change in the standard did not happen until last year. And so I wanted to point out this example um, for a few reasons. Um, first, it's because unlike the spirometer, it doesn't just produce a racial fact. 
it normalizes unequal treatment. Um, and it very efficiently distracted folks from the very real, very observable social fact that Black people were dying at higher rates from kidney disease and were waiting longer for transplants in part because of this measure. Um, so it's almost as if this race norming literally blinded people to inequality and therefore left them free to reproduce it and to protect its reproduction for 20 years. And this isn't the only example. Um, in a 2020 article in the published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, this article analyzed um, you know, 13 different clinical algorithms that use a patient's race um, in the calculations. And it found that in every case, the result was to lower the quality of care that patients of color receive. And finally, I think that this case demonstrates the dangers of algorithms um, and used in this sort of institutionalized context, because once they've been institutionalized on in how people understand the disease, i.e. once this sort of racial belief becomes a racial fact, um, um, right, it becomes very, very difficult to change. Right. So there were assuredly fights about the science, um, but make no mistake, it's expensive to change organizational practice. And with Medicaid being the primary payer of dialysis and kidney transplants, I put money on the fact <laughs> that ponying up more funds to increase care for black patients was part of the institutional concern and change. So although one study produced a change and a second legitimated it, it took scores to finally shift on the landscape and to finally make um, a comprehensive change. And you know, I honestly would argue that even that change wouldn't have happened without a political movement headed by students. I also think it's a really good example of why any conversation on rationing healthcare should be really wary of the promise of these so, of so-called ethical algorithms. Um, some bioethicists have focused on the promise of ethical algorithms for ration and care um, in much the same way that I talked about the promise um, of, of, of algorithms to sort of reduce provider um, bias in reproducing um, um, racism within the healthcare encounter, um, you know, which is that clinicians obviously carry biases that they bring to these kinds of decisions. Um, and if we had some kind of algorithm um, that might make care um, and the rationing of care um, more just. Um, um, i.e., you know, the algorithm can eliminate biases and provide consistency for rationing decisions. But, you know, the EGFR example should really give us pause um, in wanting to rely on the ethics of algorithms because the so-called neutral data going into these calculations were a product of a commitment to seeing and finding racial difference, and therefore so was the result. Right. And consequently, it naturalizes the conditions that might lead to a group being deemed a sicker and less likely to respond to treatment. Um, so if that is one of the measures being used in determining um, whether um, to provide care to an individual or not, right, um, these sort of um, pre-existing health disparities then become um, the reason why um, future and further health disparities um, then are reproduced, right? So just like Cartwright's production of race um, um, might obscure um, the environmental um, sources that produce poor lung function um, in, in Black um, adults during the antebellum South, such as higher rates of asthma, such as exposure to, um, um, to um, industrial um, byproducts, um, such as um, poor housing, right? Um, his production um, of these sort of racial statistics sort of obscured all of those differences. Um, um, and so similarly, an ethical algorithm that uses, for example, data that comes out of pre-existing health disparities can hide how health disparities actually happen. Um, um, and the way in which, um, so there's a way in which we can think of these algorithms as potentially holding patients accountable for the harms perpetuated against them, um, instead of focusing our attention on the real target. Um, so you know, lastly, I really wanted to sort of zero in on the specter of worker resistance. Um, because, you know, um, in preparing for this talk, I looked at all of the kind of um, corporate and institutional ads sort of touting the use of AI in healthcare. Um, and when you do that, everyone really focuses in on the level of the primary form of that relationship. Let's be real, is through surveillance and constraint. 
Um, um, and the idea right, is that the surveillance and constraint will have the effect of disrupting um, um, bias, right? Um, but it also can have the effect of disrupting forms of resistance that employees engage in. Um, so before I talk about the implications of AI um, um, in the ability of workers to resist, um, I want to actually sort of talk about two examples um, existence of resistance. So one of these examples comes from my own experience, my own field work. Um, when I was working on my first book, um, I spent a lot of time with frail, um, older um, African-American adults. Um, this population of older adults um, needed a great deal of support um, to remain living independently in that community. Um, and so one of the supports that was really crucial for maintaining their independence was the assistance um, of the support of a home health care aid. And I'll never forget the first time I sat with a man who I'll call Mr. Franks. Um, the first time um, um, I uh, met one of his aides, I admit I didn't pay much attention to what it was that she was doing. But I did notice at the end that Mr. Franks had to sign off on everything she had done. Um, so she had been at his house for about 90 minutes, um, but the form that her agency used for reimbursement um, from the payer clearly stated that she was supposed to, in this 90 minutes, have bathed Mr. Franks, um, perhaps helped him shave, um, did light meal prep, cleaned up after the meal prep, and engaged in light, light housekeeping. Um, I don't know um, if any of you have ever tried to make a meal, clean up after a meal, clean a house, bathe and dress an adult in 90 minutes. Um, um, it really was an impossible task. So I watched the aide sort of take the form and use her pen and check off all the boxes, even though she had done less than half of all the things listed. And she turned the form over to Mr. Franks to sign. So my first thought was, is she taking advantage? Um, because I watched her and um, you know, I knew that she hadn't done the things that the form said she had done. Um, but I began to sort of keep paying attention um, as this aide and others returned day after day. And I came to a different understanding of what they were doing. The form was an attempt at surveillance and control. And it was attempting to hold the aide to account for doing what was really an impossible job. You know, moreover, the sort of constraints of even the 90 minutes were very, very difficult for many of the aides to manage. Um, aides who relied on public transportation um, would often arrive late um, for their appointments because the agency um, really only gave them 30 minutes to go from house to house. And if you've ever tried to take public transportation from place to place, 30 minutes is never enough. So what had emerged was a kind of give and take. All right. Um, so Mr. Franks, for example, um, didn't just want someone to microwave a store-bought um, um, frozen meal, which is really the only way that light meal prep could be a part of the goals attained in 90 minutes. He wanted someone who would cook. So sometimes an aide uh, might spend 45 minutes to an hour cooking up an elaborate meal that Mr. Frank could eat for several days. Sometimes an aide trying to manage her transportation wo woes would actually cook the food in her off hours, bring it with her, right, um, in order to sort of try to manage um, the, the sort of friction of travel. She would sort of trade this time in and out. So um, in trade with Mr. Franks, um, he traded in something that he valued for something that he valued less. For him, housekeeping was not really his concern. Outside of the kitchen, this was something that was very rarely done by his aides. But here the aide and Mr. Franks were making um, a way out of no way through negotiating the form. Both of them were agreeing to mislead the agency and the payer that had dictated that all of these tasks could be done in 90 minutes. This act of resistance, of course, could only be and exist because the form was a fairly poor and inefficient means of surveillance. But this act of resistance was also an act of care, right? The aide could have just done the aspects that she wanted to do, um, but she prioritized helping Mr. Franks get some of his needs met within the impossible constraints of her work. So, you know, when we move up from the home healthcare aide all the way up the chain of command, um, 
you know, we sort of arrive at a set of workers who we expect um, to make autonomous decisions, right? So in here, I'm sort of referencing the work of Adia Harvey Wingfield in her book, Flatlining, um, where she interviews and spends time with black healthcare workers in order to understand their experience working as racialized people in healthcare. And what she found is this, that healthcare institutions participate in racial outsourcing, um, relying heavily on black doctors, nurses, and techs to do what she calls equity work, extra labor that makes organizations and their services um, more accessible um, to a diverse population of people. Um, she also argues that these organizations, um, because they've become more profit driven, have really come to depend on the work um, of black healthcare professionals to perform this equity work um, to increasingly diverse patient populations. But right, this work um, is usually and almost always done without recognition, compensation, or support. But um, when they take on this equity work, um, the workers do get some satisfaction in doing what I call sort of improvising resistance to the systems that reproduce inequality. When they find themselves having the power to do so, they protected black patients from institutional racism. Um, and they also work to keep the kinds of institutions that served low income populations um, that cared for their community. So even in the face of constraint, they marshaled resistance and they marshaled resistance in ways that were specific to who they were as individuals, not just as physicians who would make the same decision no matter the patient. So I began this talk by asking um, that when it comes to ending racial discrimination in healthcare, is you know, algorithmic thinking, um, does it represent a promise or peril? And now I can confess that this framing was a little bit of a misdirect. Um, because from where I stand, AI on its own is nothing but peril. Not because I'm afraid of the future, but because I understand our past. No algorithm, intelligent, automated, or otherwise, is going to rid us of racial inequality. So in the last few years, um, we've seen um, the appellation of new um, to a host of new analyses. Um, so you had Michelle Alexander's book that came out, The New Jim Crow, um, in reference to the ways in which the prison industrial complex reproduces um, the sort of Jim Crow system right through the sort of prison system. More recently, there's Rua Benjamin's work, The New Jim Code, that looks at how algorithms and tech are reproducing racial inequality within its code. And these are both important reads, in part because they reveal that what was old is new, because what was old has remained. Right? So the racial logics that drove Samuel Cartwright in 1850 to defend slavery is not only embedded in this barometer, it's embedded at the core of our social institutions. But I think there is hope for the future. But it won't be in the specifics of the code or in the data or in the way in which it's applied. It will be in changing the social relations themselves. So I started out this talk by positioning myself as someone who sees healthcare as a workplace. Um, that's because in many ways it is. But the kind of workplace that it has come to be doesn't have to be the kind of workplace um, that it is in the future. So much about what the application of algorithms or the broader suite of tech solutions in healthcare are about surveillance and constraint, um, which to me, these words sound exactly like the industrial workplace, right? Kind of like an Amazon warehouse where the work is boiled down to a set of tasks and the workers are surveilled to be more efficient in carrying them out. But that isn't the only way of thinking about the work because the work could be described as producing care. So when I described the case of Mr. Franks and his home healthcare aides, I chose that example for a reason. Because you know, in the sort of stratified world of home healthcare, a home healthcare aide is the sort of lowest status, low in paying position, where no one assumes that workers have or deserve to have any autonomy or independence. But what if we understood these aides as not simply dispensers of work or doers of tasks, but as someone with expertise and care? and someone who has expertise in creating caring relations, which is what I found that Mr. Frank's aides um, and himself did under stressful conditions. 
If we saw that the encounter in the same way that Mr. Franks and his aides did, what different data might we collect? Not because the data is better or more accurate, but because it reflects a fundamentally different rendering and value of the work, the worker, and therefore the patient who's being cared for. I also chose Harvey Wingfield's book on Black healthcare workers to point out um, that these Black physicians, nurses, and, and, and techs actually know quite a bit about how to go about making the system better for their patients. And so I want to leave you with the thought, um, what if instead of extracting value and free material and emotional labor from these workers, we saw them as sources of knowledge and expertise? And finally, you know, one of the things that algorithms do is that it systematically hides many of the actors who shape these relations. So when thinking about the illustrative cases that I talked about, I want to point out that part of the reason why they could be analyzed and critiqued is because the data and the algorithmic logics that produced them were freely and publicly available to historians, to med students, and to patient advocates. But the future of AI, however, promises to be proprietary because our healthcare system is proprietary, right? So it won't be Cartwright in the exam room, it'll be a tech firm. And when questions are raised about the ideology that produces these algorithms, there will be no response except one carefully crafted from the marketing or PR department. So the real peril of AI then is that we will continue to reproduce the same social relations built on inequality and an imbalance of power favoring corporate elites because the peril is not in AI, it's with us. So with that, I will close um, and I guess open the floor for questions. Well, Tanya, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I really appreciated all those little elements that you, you kind of brought to our attention and perhaps you know we haven't really thought about in terms of you know the interactions between healthcare and race and the standards of care as suggested by algorithms and one of the things which kind of intrigued me was the notion that you brought up about the the bias shifting where these biases kind of like they get embedded into the system and they just get kind of propagated along and no one ever asks like why they're there and they just become facts and then we just come to expect them. And I was, I was also intrigued because you were pointing out these different uh, examples of where some of these things have embedded themselves. And I was curious if you were familiar with the, um, the science of cranionom craniometry, hmm. which is the, um, it was a, a, a technology, if you will, from the mid to late 1800s, which was considered very sophisticated in its day. And it was the device used to measure the lumps and bumps on your head to make inferences about the functional areas of the underlying brain structure. And this was used all over. And in fact, those little phrenology heads that you can buy and, you know, on Amazon for about 20 bucks, uh, those are really the product of that, um, it, which is you know, now kind of a debunked science. But it was used in those, those days to actually justify the, and me measure and then justify the inferior intellectual inferiority of, of Black Americans, um, justify beliefs about their, um, their criminal tendencies, their employability, and importantly, education. And it just took... The residue of this now debunked and you know, misapplied science, which seemed very sophisticated, took decades for it to wash out of the system. We're still kind of dealing with its effects today. I was interested if you knew about that or if you had any other examples of where that kind of thing has happened. Um, you know, th there are ways in which sort of the racial science of the, of the 18 and 1900s was really quite prolific and really quite productive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am sort of familiar. Um, um, I hadn't called it sort of referred to as sort of craniology. I'd heard it sort of mostly called um, the sort of phonology, the sort of production yeah. um, of these sort of racial differences through looking at one's head. And I, I think, you know, for me, you know, um, the thing that, that becomes really interesting about these things, because there's ways in which when you sort of go back in hindsight and um, look at these, there's ways in which the um, 
the sort of process um, through which people believe that they were producing good science seems vaguely ridiculous. But, but I think the thing that's quite amazing is the ways in which murkiness becomes precise when you are using um, 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 data and algorithms, right? Um, so you're taking something that seems really quite murky, really quite problematic, really, really difficult to reproduce. But the moment you put a number on it, it is suddenly transformed into something that's precise and something that travels, right? When you sort of create sort of um, data um, on which either theories or algorithmic decision-making are um, overlaid, the data itself seems to produce um, 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 legitimacy through the production of precision. So there is something where, you know, um, numbers are almost a rhetorical device, um, right? So you could talk, for example, you know, about, you know, particular theories um, that underlie it. People may debate the theory, but the moment you produce numbers, there seems nothing left to debate. <laughs> um, um, and I think that that is, you know, again, you know, one of the things that um, you know, troubles me about the idea of data being proprietary and the sort of algorithmic logics being proprietary um, is that it becomes very, very difficult then to sort of unpack, um, you know, um, the sort of rhetoric of precision um, that seems to sort of be overlaid here. Yeah, I, I, I totally appreciate that. And one of the things which is, I think, maybe helpful, maybe you can advise us on is how do people who are developing algorithms, they're, they're basically, they're gonna be the future of AI. And that's, you know, the people who are participating in our activities, really. What can they do to see it coming and to kind of, you know, uh, understand it and recognize it and then to try and, you know, tack the other direction to counterbalance those effects? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought about this sort of idea of having something hopeful to say. <laughs> <laughs> <That would've... laughs> Um, we appreciate I, that. <laughs> but I think sometimes the difficulty is believing or asserting um, that these sort of structural underpinnings can be improved through an application or through a tech, a piece of technology. Like there's there's something that um, um, you know. We look. We look at this. You know the. You know the example that I talked about, spirometer, right? Um, we look at the ways in which you know 150 years later, um, you know, um, you know, um, um, even though the the technology of the spirometer, right, um, has certainly moved and shifted over time, um, the ways in which ways in which we did not actually see any movement in the in the the actual sort of you know racial fact, if you will, um, that got reproduced, um, um, and so I think that for me, one of them is really right thinking about um, you know the importance of the publicness of these algorithms um, or, the, or, the, or the logic underneath them. I mean, I do not think there's any way that a proprietary algorithm um, that is not open um, to um, you know, folks thinking it through um, um, you know, you know, with community, with scholars, with advocates, advocates, um, you know, um, really has a sort of hope of, um, of really sort of not producing these sort of racial logics, in part because they're embedded in us, right? Um, you know, the things that our society produce, produces reflects who it is that we are. And if we haven't grappled with our own sort of racialized thinking and our own racial logics, everything we produce is going to reproduce um, the society. And so really, you know, honestly, I think it takes um, you know, a community of people thinking um, through these kinds of logics. I think, you know, in the sort of, um, you know, in the sort of broader community, for example, um, of folks who are sort of, you know, thinking about sort of um, um, racial data um, and their use in sort of tech um, um, and algorithms outside of the healthcare, there really has been a lot of um, sort of groundswell of community organizing um, around, um, you know, being at the table. And part of being at the table isn't just to provide um, ideas. It really is about um, the transparency um, of, you know, what is happening so that it can be 
critiqued and shaped. So it really isn't about you know, the thing itself or figuring out how to improve the thing itself. It really is about having these sort of cultures of transparency. And I think the other way too is, you know, for me, one of the things, reasons why I wanted to sort of focus um, on um, the things that workers know um, is that we often don't know the things that workers know because we never bother to ask them because we don't really care <laughs> if they're sort of <laughs> carrying out these tasks. Right. But what if we did care? Right. What if, you know, we spent time right, asking them to help us understand how some of the applications that are being developed um, um, may help them to better do their um, job of the, as they define it, which is usually not the efficient doing of the work. It's about providing quality care. Um, and that really is a value. Right? And that's a value that is increasingly sort of squeezed out of healthcare. Care is increasingly absent. And so if you have um, an absence right, and a pulling out of every shred of care under the guise of efficiency um, and sort of getting rid of individual level variation and therefore bias, right? Um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to um, create algorithms that actually are going to reproduce the values of care. Right? So you talked a little bit about the, the past informing the future. What sort of steps would you like to see if they could begin today, clinicians in the healthcare industry, uh, you know, industrial complex, uh, what, what could they do today to help start mitigating any harm and disparity that these algorithms are kind of, uh, you know, producing? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you're talking about the sort of level of mitigation, um, you know, there are probably sort of more practical things um, that, can, that can happen. You know, I've talked about transparency. Um, I also think that it, it matters um, who's at the table. Um, so, you know, again, you know, one of the reasons why you know I sort of focused on what it is that workers know um, um, is that I don't actually think we have enough sort of bread and butter providers um, at the table um, in the sort of development of these applications. Um, um, you know, I think we have providers who are involved, but they tend to be involved as entrepreneurs, <laughs> um, right? <laughs> um, they, they don't tend to actually be be involved um, simply um, um, as, a, as a sort of key stakeholder into providing sort of community care. Um, um, and so I really think that if you took seriously um, the experience that workers have um, sort of navigating this terrain and ask them, you know, how, what would um, a tool look like and what would a sort of algorithm look like that would make your work as you define it and as you value it to be, right? What would that look like? Um, um, because I think right now we are solving problems as defined by employers. We're not solving problems as defined by workers. Mm -hmm. Um, and patients. So if you ask patients and, and providers to talk about what problems they want to have solved, you would come up with a very different kind of end tool than if you asked employers. Oh, I, I'm sure you're right. And another thing which kind of, was, as you were thinking or speaking, I was thinking about the role of, of trust and the, the embedding trust into the algorithms which kind of made me think about what can we do to encourage people of color and from you know, communities who are not otherwise well represented in AI and machine learning and algorithm development, how can we encourage them to be more participatory? What can we do to encourage uh, people of color to you know, become coders or to take part in, in these discussions? What can we do better? You know, as you ask this question, I had a thought that I've never had before. Um, and one of them, because I think you know, often, right, the sort of quest to sort of, you know, the sort of standard idea is, you know, um, encourage people to come to community-based meetings and, and to sort of ask for their input. Um, um, and I think the other thing is to sort of, you know, encourage people to sort of enter in to the terrain um, through, um, you know, being employed um, by a particular company develop, developing AI or a particular lab developing AI. You know, um, 
And those often are problematic, right? Um, because on one hand, it is true that having more diverse people around the table, um, you know, has the potential to sort of create more um, um, diverse ideas. You know, one of the, the difficulties and problems with always asking, for example, lay community members to sort of show up um, is that, you know, the experts at the table are getting paid for their time, the community participants are not, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> there are ways in which, right, always being asked to sort of be involved in your spare time, on one hand is nice, but on the other hand, it's a burden. Yeah, right? sure. And I think the second, you know, issue with sort of, you know, you know, maybe having sort of more diverse first faces sort of employed in these organizations is if I'm an employee of an organization, I may look like the community, right? And I might try my best, right, to sort of speak on behalf of the community, but I am also a worker for this organization, right? Um, and so one of the things that I think would be an interesting, um, um, you know, thing that, you know, maybe it exists. Um, I know that we have um, um, some, some, perhaps some organizers or people who've been involved in sort of community-based work in the audience um, is, you know, allowing the community to pick an expert to work on their behalf. One who was accountable to them and not to an employer, um, but who has the expertise and the time to sort of show up and do the work. Um, I think that to me, that would actually be um, a, a way of having um, community input from these various diverse communities um, in a way that's respectful of their time and for the person has independence and autonomy as well as the expertise to sort of speak on their behalf. Latanya, thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour. And, and this has just been a delightful presentation. It's been wonderful to talk to you and to, to hear your thoughts and to hear your vision. I, I just thoroughly enjoyed listening to you today. And uh, I, I'm sure that I'm speaking for all of our participants and everybody who will watch this moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. And to everybody who is listening, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we will uh, wish you a great weekend. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.